Um, thank you all for coming and listening to me on such a horrible evening. Um, I'm going to talk as briefly as possible, I may go on for ages, in which case just start waving at me, um, about uh, drones, which are all these things are sort of about drones, uh, but why for me it's not really about the drones at all and why, why I've been interested in them for a while. Um, several of these works are actually kind of a couple of years old now, so um, I don't always talk about them so much, but I always have quite a lot to say. Anyway, um, I'm going to just also talk about a lot of pictures of drones um, because I keep getting asked about the imagery in this stuff and why that's interesting. Um, so I'm going to start with this picture. Um, I call this picture like the canonical drone or like the ultimate drone um, because it's the drone um, you see the most. It's, it's, it's an image that I became fascinated with a while back because I kept seeing this particular picture of a drone. Um, most of the time when I say drone, I mean this. I mean like the huge military flying ones, uh, not so much the little helicopter ones, so those are important as well. Um, I'm really talking mostly about military technology and, and something that looks like this. Uh, and because this is, as I say, the picture we keep seeing. And the reason you see this picture so often is for a very long time, it was the number one Google image result for drone. Um, actually, this is no longer the true. If you Google image drone now, you usually see the little helicopters. But for a long time, this is what you'd see. And this image was always number one. And so um, because um, everybody, including journalists, are lazy, this image kind of went everywhere. And the more it was reproduced, the more it would be number one, and the more it would be reproduced again and again. So you'd see it everywhere. And you'd see it in kind of newspaper reports like this, or you'd see it, um, this is actually Pakistan's number one English language newspaper, so they reproduce that image. Or you'd see it on um, campaign sites about the drone. Um, or you'd even see it kind of in protests and being reproduced elsewhere in the world, all over the world, always using this particular image of the drone. Which is weird, because if you look really closely at this image, there's a lot wrong with it. Um, it's, in fact, completely fake. Um, this is not a photograph of a drone at all. Um, it's, in fact, a, a CGI composite uh, was created by a guy on like a 3D hobbyist forum, right? Um, who um, just like as, as an exercise in making 3D models created uh, a Reaper drone like this, um, you know, just to be, just so we could get really good at curves. Uh, and he posted it online and I I've, I've found, I tracked him down and found this kind of original, like the original of this uh, incredibly important image and asked him how he constructed it and how he'd like made the smoke and how he'd got like images of mountains in Pakistan to put behind it to make it look more real. Um, and I think it's so popular because it's one of the few images you see of a drone actually firing a missile. Um, but, but more than that, what's, what I find so extraordinary about this image is that the most reproduced image of this increasingly ubiquitous technology is itself a complete fabrication, a creation of the technology itself, and really just a kind of dream, just a kind of way of imagining what this thing might be, uh, that is, as, as the thing itself, kind of produced uh, through our use of technologies. And as I say, some of these things are a few years old now, and it's almost hard to remember now that a while back, like, no one was really talking about the drones, no one was really thinking about them, and they weren't really in the media, uh, even though they'd actually been kind of operating in battlefields for several years. And when I first kind of started reading about them, I was really fascinated by them uh, and weirded out that people weren't talking about them more because suddenly we have like flying robots firing missiles at war and no one seemed to think this was a very big deal. Um, and also that, that, that this wasn't, um, it wasn't being represented or discussed, but also that I didn't understand even then why I was so fascinated in them. What was it about these objects that I found sort of so compelling? Because um, it's quite easy to be a bit kind of like macho or nerdy about them and just be sort of excited about them as just kind of whiz-bang technologies. And I wanted to make sure very carefully that I wasn't doing that, that I was actually thinking through the thing. And so when I get interested in things like that, I tend to get quite obsessed um, and have this kind of like close encounters of the third kind relationships that, you know, where he becomes obsessed over like building a little mountain in various models. So I was buying like models of these things. You can buy like airfix kits, you know, like kind of a toy soldier type kits and building those. And, but there was something I, particularly making models like this, that wasn't enough. Um, it wasn't enough to have like a real sense of the thing. And I wanted to know what it would be like to actually like stand in front of one of these things and have like a kind of physical relationship with it. Because 
like we're quite simple creatures and without having those kind of objects or those kind of images it's very hard for us to think through these things clearly I find um, so one day went out into the you know um, car park of my studio in London uh, as was then with my friend Einar um, and we sketched out we downloaded the plans for one of these things off the internet and we literally drew the size of it um, out in the car park not even really knowing what we were doing but as soon as we did it we kind of realized what this was for uh, and it's suddenly a whole bunch of my questions about why I was interested in this thing sort of made sense to me um, not least the fact uh, that their invisibility is one of their kind of signifying qualities um, that the drone is, is something that's designed to be invisible uh, both literally invisible as in they fly at kind of 50,000 feet for hours and hours at a time you, you literally can't see them you wouldn't know they're up there in the sky but also that they're politically and morally invisible uh, that they're used in place of manned planes uh, so that there aren't questions of body bags coming home that they facilitate kind of new types of war uh, that, that allow governments to make war in kind of new ways and also that thing about that kind of invisibility and intangibility for me kind of it feels like all technologies today it feels like the internet it feels like the the spaces in which we spend so much of our time that aren't real um, or at least they're entirely real to us but they don't have a physical form that we can relate to so so much of this is about taking those forms and literally just kind of sketching them and drawing them out and I've since drawn those drone shadows um, all over the place and and as I'm sure some of you know uh, several of them have been drawn around um, Ljubljana this week which is fantastic the time lapse at the beginning was of one being drawn and there's a couple of other ones as well and in part that's made possible because one thing I did was that I also made like a guide to drawing them um, so I uh, put together um, all the plans that I had for these things and you can go online and you can download these plans and anyone can make one of them which has been really nice because then they happen in different contexts as well so it's not just the ones that I make or that art institutions make but people make them at um, uh, in, in other situations as well this is one that was just drawn a couple of weeks ago in, uh, in London at the site of a big arms fair at a, a protest against against these and other kinds of weapons so it became a kind of tool that was available to be out there and be used um, again you know it's not necessarily also about the thing itself but also where investigating it and trying to look at it kind of leads you um, so I did this one in Washington DC a couple of years ago that's actually the White House right there which was kind of amazing um, so that people going into the White House were literally walking over this thing as they went to it uh, and, and probably more people there than anyone else would actually know what this thing is because uh, lots of people don't necessarily recognize what they are um, but in order to um, uh, to understand it um, or to, to, to generate another image of it I bought satellite imagery of Washington DC uh, from a commercial provider to try and see if I could see the drone shadow from space uh, and it turned out that I couldn't quite see it uh, from space because the lines are so thin the resolution isn't quite enough like you can see the street you've all seen Google Maps you know how you can kind of see that stuff but actually to see a line that thin wasn't really possible but what was amazing was happened was that I bought actual satellite imagery um, which comes in very specific image formats and strange things happen um, and I realized that I solved another problem that I'd been working on for a while which was trying to understand these things um, I call these the rainbow planes and they're another one of my obsessions um, if you spend enough time on Google Maps you'll see these things flying around um, uh, usually kind of near, near airports or where there's, they're at a kind of the right height to do this and I've been kind of using this image for a long time as this kind of emblem of like a different way of seeing the world of seeing the world through the eyes of technology uh, that is sometimes kind of beautiful and amazing to us but not always quite understandable in how it happens um, but by, by the fact that I bought the satellite imagery trying to see the drone meant that I understood what was happening here which is that satellite imagery is produced in layers of different frequencies so satellite images see separately in red green and blue in, in black and white and in infrared and the ultraviolet so they have this different way of seeing the world when that's put together for very fast images you get something that looks like this or indeed something like looks like this which is another installation which is obviously of the rainbow plane um, which is I really hope I'm going to be able to get the satellite image of this one because it's really big um, but again it's this instead of being a representation of the invisible technology it's a representation of a technology that's only visible to the technology itself that tries to explain kind of back to us how the world is, is seen by our technologies but not always 
uh, quite the way that we see it, and essentially trying to supply images that help you kind of make that argument and have that discussion. Um, the second project that's represented here um, happened because I wanted to kind of scale up from the object of the drone itself to, um, to its wider context, to try and understand you know, how it operates in the world in relationship to kind of everything else. Because the drone is really just like the pointy end of the network, right? It's just like one moving mechanical piece that's actually always connected to satellites and teams of people and all the you know, manufacturing that created it. It's, a, it's like the most object, net, uh, networked object that there is. Um, it just happens to be kind of, you know, used for, used for killing people. Um, and in particular, I was you know, reading reports, particularly of how it killed people. Um, something really struck me about, yeah, again, this kind of invisibility and this, this technological distance, which is that um, uh, there's journalistic organisations like the Bureau of Investigative Journalism who collect um, uh, the drone strikes which are not released in the media. So these are drone strikes that happen in Somalia and the Yemen and Pakistan, places like this, which, um, which are not kind of officially spoken of. We all know they're going on, but there's um, very little information about them. But crucially, even reading these amazing reports that journalists have put a lot of work into collecting, um, there were no images. And that again struck me as being kind of very interesting and very telling. Because we live in a, like a mass media age where we're used to having almost constant access to all of this stuff and also it being represented and shown to us. So it feels very deliberate, uh, very much part of the plan when you're not shown images of this stuff. Uh, and the other very strange thing about this is that actually, um, you know, we live, as I said, we live in this time of proliferation of images. Uh, and and we've spent the last 20 years particularly gathering as many images of the world as possible. And that you can go on, you know, you can pull out your phone and you can zoom into any part of the Earth's surface that's been captured uh, by, by satellites, that's been transmitted to you, that has created a total picture of the Earth. Um, so in this project, um, Dronestagram, I took those images of places. I went and found the places mentioned in those reports where drone strikes occurred, and I went and photographed them through the view of the satellite. Right? These photos, these images of the world that had just been gathered, kind of put into huge databases that are sitting there kind of waiting for us to come along and discover them again and kind of give meaning to them. Um, I found those for the drone strike locations and posted them back to social media, to Instagram and to Twitter and to Tumblr. Um, essentially to sort of close that loop between, um, uh, both between like the, these networks, the, the networks that the drones run on and the networks that kind of our social media run on. Um, and just to kind of, um, yeah, to put some of this imagery kind of back into the world, to kind of give it a meaning again. Um, and it's quite interesting doing that kind of within the frame of social media, within a place that people go every day. Because they say they're kind of the same networks. The military networks and social networks, they run on the same principle. Uh, they both kind of facilitate sight and action at a distance. That's what they're for. One of them is just tuned towards kind of violence and secrecy, and the other one allegedly towards kind of bringing us closer together and showing us things we wouldn't see before. Um, so Don't Scam has uh, had a huge number of followers who get very, very angry in the comments, which is brilliant, because that's kind of what social media is for. Um, but kind of also be buried beneath the drone thing is one kind of quite interesting thing as well, I think, which is that um, when the first thing anyone sees when, the first thing anyone says when they see one of the drone shadows is that they go like, oh my god, I had no idea it was so big. Which is like a really simple thing to say, but again, very important, because the next question is like, hang on a second, like, how did I not know how big this thing is? How did I not understand what this thing is beforehand? Um, and the thing on Dronestagram, the first comment is always like, I don't want to click like, but, right? Which is such a simple reaction to social media, but such an important thing to get across that even here, we're operating within a design technological environment that's designed to produce certain relationships and experiences. And that by kind of putting this kind of material back into it, you can actually have a much larger discussion about, about the, all of the politics that goes not just into the drone, but into the, into the things we use every day. And Dronestagram threw so much of that into like really sharp relief, um, because it was one of my projects that got a kind of huge amount of press. Um, and I, this is not about me boasting that this was like really a celebrity project, but it was just like watching the discussion of this project happen in media was kind of terrifying. 
Because first of all, there was a kind of complete inability to discuss, like to, to really even describe what it was. Like for newscasters or, or journalists to write about what an app was versus a social media platform versus the internet itself, what satellite imagery was, all of this kind of stuff. And also, the, 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 always the undertone that because this happened on social media, it wasn't really that serious, right? That it's just kind of a silly little thing over there that's not worth talking about. And it's just like, how on earth we're supposed to have a like, meaningful conversation about the way the world operates, about the way wars happen, or about the kind of political discussions that are happen, when we can't have a meaningful discussion about the technologies that each and every one of us use every day. Uh, that we, ha we lack a kind of deep basic knowledge of how that stuff works that, in that for me just kind of informs everything else. Um, while, while looking for uh, drone images and um, uh, the drone sky images and also the rainbow plane images and basically just spending way too much time on Google Maps, um, I started to find actual drones as well. Uh, and I found an actual drone shadow in this case and this was on Google Maps and this is a, an image captured by a satellite of a drone um, just landing at Creech Air Force Base in Nevada. Um, and I started looking for, for more and more of these. Um, and, and finding them, this is Holloman Air Force Base in, um, in New Mexico in 2011. It, just something extraordinary about the fact that, again, these most secretive machines had been captured by satellites, uh, by civilian satellites, and were just sitting there in databases waiting to be discovered. Um, and I've got there's uh, some of them up here, but I've, I've collected over 100 of these images now. Um, and a lot of these, the, the really good early easy ones to find were the ones at American sort of training bases. Um, but then you start to find them in other places as well. This is Kandahar in Afghanistan. And you start to realize there's like a footprint of these things scattered around the world. Um, or in, um, this is a base in Iraq. Um, you know, and this, was, this is back in 2004. And there's also something kind of strange in the timing in that this image didn't appear online for kind of years afterwards. And you realize that even the, there's a control over the images within those services that we're able to see. Um, but this one was an incredibly key one. This was in Pakistan. And this was in all of the newspapers when it happened. Because this image appeared on Google Maps um, at a time when both uh, the Americans and the Pakistanis were denying that drones were operating in Pakistan. And yet you could go on Google Maps and you could see the actual things that were there. And we hear a lot about kind of citizen journalism or this kind of activism, but just that pure access to information to me is, is something quite extraordinary. And it's worth emphasizing that it carries on. This is um, uh, Niamey in Niger last year, where American drones were assisting in the um, surveillance and possibly more of Boko Haram in um, Nigeria. Um, or in fact, just a couple of months ago, this is the first time I've managed to find a Chinese drone. Um, uh, because, of course, this is a, a now an arms race and which is happening all over the world. Um, the Chinese drones, by the way, are operating also now in Nigeria. Uh, and we know this because one crashed quite recently. Um, and I started to collect now images as well of drones, uh, of the wreckage of these things, of the kind of aftermath of them. This is a, a drone crashed in Nigeria. And I just show you these because I think they're fascinating. Um, or like another another image of these technologies that we don't see so often, uh, which is when they fail. Um, and then they fail, and then people find them, and then they take selfies of themselves with them, and they put them on social media. This is a guy in Iraq who literally like, found this thing outside his town, uh, like just belly down on the sand, and posted, posted himself posing with it on, on Twitter. Uh, or, uh, I can't turn that sound off, that's interesting. But anyway, um, this is uh, another picture. Film. This is cell phone footage from Afghanistan, another crash drone, um, which near a village where the villagers actually come out and they start throwing stones at the drone, which is a kind of really magical kind of interaction with the third thing. Um, so, it, it, but it feels like these images are now making their own way out into the world, right? Um, that uh, it's it's um, the, the the coverage of them has expanded so much. It feels less and less necessary to do this kind of finding. But there's still always going to be places in which that is, is kind of not accessible. But again, it stops being about the object, or it stops being about the thing itself, and it starts to become something more about a fundamental understanding of the drone and of its, and of its technology and, and what that means in the world. Um, and this is my sort of example of that, which is that um, I do a lot of uh, annoying government organizations with freedom of information requests. 
And there was this weird moment around the Olympics in London a couple of years ago when um, the police, just before the Olympics, said they were going to use drones to police the Olympics. Uh, and they didn't really specify anything about them. They didn't, they didn't talk about them very much. Um, but um, after the Olympics happened, I started filing requests like this, saying, hi, what happened? Did you use drones? Were there drones flying over London, what this is? And after uh, over a year of very legalistic discussion and stuff, I basically got a formal judgment from not just the police, but from like the information commissioner in, in the UK, the person who decides what you're allowed to tell the public, which basically said that drones are magic. Um, was their kind of official position on this, and they didn't have to tell me anything. And like, this got weird because I was like, they wouldn't tell me if they'd use drones. And I was like, well, do you have any drones? And we're like, well, I can't tell you that. And like, but you'll tell me if you've got a helicopter or a car. And they're like, yes. No, but no, but no drones because drones are magic. Right? And the thing about drones being magic is the fact is they're not. Right? They're just planes. But they're technologies that have a certain use and a certain aura. And so they move from context to context, and they take that context with them as they go. And drones were developed really quite specifically in the context of the Israel-Palestine conflict uh, in order to produce a kind of, uh, to, 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 you know, to take forward a certain kind of warfare among civilian populations, among built-up areas. And then when that technology is exported, the kind of warfare that it produced is then produced elsewhere in the world. And we get to have more and more wars that are like that. And also the attitudes of secrecy that surround that also travel with the technology. So it's so much more than, than, the, uh, than the, um, the object itself. It's our entire kind of political construction around it. Um, and as an example, and a, a very unpleasant one, of something that really emphasizes the context that it makes possible, um, this is a, a piece of paper that, uh, that, that embodies the, the, the magic proportions of this stuff. This is a, um, a letter from the Home Secretary in the UK to the um, family of a guy called Mohammed Saka. And Mohammed Saka was um, a guy from London uh, who, grew up, who was born and grew up in North London, a few miles from where I used to live and, and from where I've lived for a long time. Uh, and in uh, 2010, while he was out of the country, um, his family got this letter saying his citizenship had been removed uh, and that he was no longer a citizen of the UK. And uh, Four months later, he was killed in a drone strike in Somalia, by, uh, in a US drone strike. And that this like, magic little act had been done around this guy's citizenship through, through the law that allowed this then strike to happen. Uh, that the technology and the law kind of interlaced in this really extraordinary way to make something like this possible. Um, and I've got a lot more I could say about that case and the implications of drones, but I actually want to use it, uh, or not use it in that way, but just say that, that because of work like that, um, I started to apply a lot of this kind of thinking about technologies to um, not just purely to the technologies, but to things like the law. Coming from a technological background, I tend to look at legal systems like I look at technological systems as sets of instructions that are kind of edited and programmed, which resulted in um, this project, which you can find online, I'd love more people too, uh, called Citizen X, which is a, uh, it's a browser extension, basically. Um, but what it does is um, it tracks your browsing online entirely privately, uh, no one else will see it, uh, and shows to you the physical infrastructure of the internet uh, that lies underneath your everyday browsing and gives you this, what I call an algorithmic citizenship, uh, which is essentially a, a new way of thinking about your identity online that's not kind of bound to a national state. Because what happened to Mohamed Saka and what happens to huge numbers of other people is that... Um, the rights and protections that we have every day, they flow from our nationality, from our citizenship. And it turns out that the nation state is no longer like a useful container for citizenship anymore. It's insufficient to contain who we are because of, in large part because of the technologies that we use every day. Um, but it turns out algorithmic uh, citizenship was actually invented by the NSA uh, as a way of like, deciding who they would surveil online. Uh, but it's not something that should be limited to that. These technologies, whether they're drones or whether they're ways of accounting for citizenship, should not purely be used against us, essentially. There's, there's concepts within there that actually we can draw out and, um, and possibly you know, to, to use in, in more democratic fashions. Because um, this is a more recent project, but it's one I'm very fascinated by at the moment. Um, so algorithmic citizenship is, as I said, the way NSA decide your citizenship and whether to surveil you. Uh, because of the laws around surveillance, um, 
you know, for example, NSA are not allowed to surveil American citizens, but all they're doing is gathering huge amounts of data and looking at all of it. So in order to, they say, get rid of some of that and not surveil American citizens, they decide who's American citizen or not based essentially on their browsing behavior, on the data that they leave behind online. Um, so basically at any moment, your citizenship is being effectively and legally decided by this collection of data and this analysis of data, um, uh, which means your human rights are essentially being decided by those things. And a huge amount of stuff that happens to you legally will be decided not by the passport or the identity card that you have, but by a, an algorithm looking at your kind of patterns of behavior and patterns of life, which of course is actually how we tend to kill people in drone strikes these days, which I wasn't going to mention the drones, but actually uh, most drone strikes, the ones in Dronestagram happen because someone was using a SIM card in a particular place and we don't even know who they are. So it's very real in that context. But this is the more kind of domestic, local version. Um, and as I say, like, so the thing about algorithmic citizenship is also not necessarily that it's kind of fragmented, or th though it may be, or that it's kind of percentage-based, but the fact that it's changing all the time, that it's being constantly uh, recalculated and recalibrated against your behavior or about the pe behavior of people in your network. And therefore, it, it becomes unstable in the, way that, um, in the way that people who perhaps are undocumented or people who are refugees, there's a lot of people for whom citizenship and identity and therefore human rights have always been deeply unstable. But this system essentially replicates that for, for all of us all of the time. Um, and my position is simply that knowing that that is the case and that it is increasingly the case, how can we take a system like this and actually think of something, a better answer, a better, a better kind of follow-up to citizenship? Um, the example I keep coming back to personally as someone who's moving around a lot at the moment is um, even just with something within the EU, the fact that we should have better systems of direct democracy today. We should have other ways of voting on transnational, international systems than we have today. I would like you guys to have a vote on uh, what happens when the UK, my country, votes on leaving the EU next year, which I really don't want them to do, but I think that's the thing in which a lot of us actually have an interest, and we have ways of representing that now. Likewise, I'm currently living in Greece, and um, they've had a series of referenda about their relationship with the EU, and I think that's as something that affects us as well. There's other ways beyond these kind of incredibly 19th century ways we have of deciding of politics that perhaps we can learn something from these technologies in order to apply them there. That's mostly what I'm thinking about at the moment, but a huge big other subject. Um, so I'll just return to the drones to sort of finish off slightly. Um, here's, I just I love showing these pictures. Um, I'll just read you the caption of this image because it's amazing. Um, this is an official US Air Force uh, photograph released by them. And the caption is, uh, Edwards Air Force Base, California. After supporting the global war on terror for three years, Global Hawk Unmanned Aerial Vehicle No. 3 received its official homecoming today when its wheels touched down at 11.30 a.m. Pacific time. This is a homecoming parade for a robot, right? That's, that's kind of what you're seeing in, in this picture. And for me, this is one of those pictures that just really embodies our kind of deep confusion about how we adapt so much of our kind of... Um, our worldview to the increased presence of technologies like this within it. Technologies that we've produced, but that we don't fully understand, or are not fully capable of, of grasping at all times, or at least, and, and, uh, which is not to say that, those, that there are not people who do grasp them and are fully in control of this situation. Um, a really good example of that is a thing called the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots, which has a brilliant name and is also a very serious campaign. Uh, and it's actually a huge international organization, like, but it's a serious one. The people I know in the UK are um, involved with this, are a, uh, an anti-weapons charity, essentially. They're the same people who work very hard to get uh, anti-personnel landmines and cluster munitions banned, right? So they had a really successful campaign to stop a particular type of weaponry being used in the world. Um, as best as our ability is to control something like this. And they're now turning their attention not to drones, really, but to the software that runs them, to what they call autonomous weapons, i.e. the fact that there will be machines out there that literally decide for themselves um, who lives or dies. But, that, the, but the problem with doing that, of course, is that no one really knows what that looks like yet because we haven't done it yet. It's 
unpleasantly and depressingly easy to show someone the effects of landmines because they've been around for a while and there's a lot of horrible pictures you can show people. But you try to explain autonomous weapons to people and it's a lot more difficult uh, because we don't know what systems like this or more wider forms of artificial intelligence will look like. So a lot of where this kind of work goes in terms of trying to um, produce images of this world and forms of understanding it like the uh, a quiet disposition database which you can see running over there which is a software system that I built to essentially mimic uh, the sort of drone intelligence gathering program. We're trying to build things that represent this and understand this so that we can kind of share some of this discussion around. Um, because AI is not also just going to be in the kind of killer robots, right? Artificial intelligence is also in, uh, in our financial systems. It's going to increasingly be in our kind of social and legal systems. Um, it's an everyday level that's also kind of you know, increasingly happening right now. If you call up to get a loan from your bank, it's run through software that very few of us actually understand but affect us all the time. So that kind of, the twin themes, I think, of automation, the replacement of humans with, with the machines, like we saw with um, that homecoming parade for the drone, and also these kind of machine intelligences that they might turn into, they're kind of being going to be the, the most important social discussions of the next kind of few decades. Um, and, and where the kind of military world goes first, like the rest of it is, is kind of short, um, short to follow. And I'll just finish with this one. Um, which is a medal that was proposed a couple of years ago uh, for, um, for drone pilots. Uh, so the US Department of Defense published the fact they were going to release a new medal. It was going to be called the Distinguished Warfare Model, uh, Medal, and it was for drone pilots. And there was a huge fuss about this because it turned out that um, in the kind of ranking table of medals, and there is such a thing, um, this would be a more important medal than the Purple Heart. And the Purple Heart is what American soldiers get when they're wounded in battle. So there was this huge outcry because this idea that people who just, you know, like the idea of playing video games, which you hear about drone warfare a lot, you know, who just like sat at the computer and done this, would be getting a more important medal than people who'd been physically wounded on the battlefield. And very quickly this idea was kind of scrapped and they put it away. Um, uh, but the problem with that is actually that we're increasingly finding, um, uh, doctors are increasingly finding that drone pilots and people who work literally as, as soldiers and pilots and spotters in the drone war are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder to the same, if not higher, levels than combat pilots. The war is no less real to them when it's kind of mediated through, through these technological systems. And for me, that is at the crux of this argument, kind of identifying the importance of looking at technologies. Because to me, it's exactly the same thing as saying that like, the experiences that we have online or experiences that are mediated through technology or even work, arts and stuff that's made about technology is somehow less important, is somehow less kind of human to us. Uh, we can all now start to uh, kind of reject that from our own experience. We've all lived with this stuff long enough to have had deep and profound personal experiences through technology and yet we still, still, still seem to lack a lot of the ability to have kind of um, discussions about it. But if, um, so for me that kind of is, is the work. Uh, we're only going to answer some of these questions and try and design new social systems or change the way we think about warfare if we work out new ways of kind of describing complexity in all its forms, technological, legal, political complexity, describing those things better, kind of democratising the understanding of them and then coming up with entirely new ways to represent and think about them. Thank you very much.